Matthew 14. Let's begin in verse number 22. <clears throat> Straightway Jesus constrained his disciples to get into a ship and to go before him unto the other side while he sent the multitudes away. And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up into a mountain apart to pray. And when the evening was come, he was there alone. But the ship was now in the midst of the sea, tossed with waves, for the wind was contrary. And in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went unto them, walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is a spirit. And they cried out for fear. But straightway Jesus spake unto them, saying, Be of good cheer, it is I, be not afraid. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it be thou, bid me come unto thee on the water. And he said, Come. And when Peter was come down out of the ship, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid, and beginning to sink, he cried, saying, Lord, save me. Immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand and caught him and said unto him, O thou of little faith, wherefore didst thou doubt? And when they were come into the ship, the wind ceased. Then they that were in the ship came and worshipped him, saying of a truth, Thou art the Son of God. And let's pray. Father, <clears throat> we want to thank you for the opportunity to be here this morning. Lord, we heard a good Sunday school lesson. Father, the singing was good this morning in the congregation. It blessed my heart. And then Sonia's special was a very convicting song about people seeing Jesus in us. We gave our tithes and offerings. And Lord, we gave our announcements. But now, Father, we come to the preaching of the word of God. And Lord, we ask that you would just arrest our attention this morning. I pray that we would hear from you this morning. I pray that I would get out the way, so to speak, and that people would hear from you and not just from a man. And so, God, I pray that you would have your will and way in the service. I pray, Lord, that you would speak to hearts. I pray, Father, for the one that perhaps is struggling in the midst of their storm, would be encouraged this morning at what took place here. And I pray, Father, that as we come to the end of this service, that we would leave a church today knowing that we've met and heard from you. So, God, I pray for the Sunday school. I pray for Sonia as she teaches today. I pray for our children as they hear a lesson about the Lord Jesus, about our God, about life. I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would speak to their heart today. And, God, that you would encourage our children. Lord, they need encouragement today. Lord, they are growing up in a, a wicked day. And, God, I pray that you would help them. I pray, God, that you would be God in our midst today. Speak to us, we ask in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. <clears throat> well, if you've been keeping an eye on the news, I'm sure most of you have, you know that uh, just recently uh, Hurricane Harvey touched down and uh, went through Texas and is now on its way up into Louisiana uh, wreaking havoc and they believe, they say, and I don't know who they are, but they say that it's probably one of the most destructive storms that uh, America has encountered for a very long time, perhaps in its history, I don't know. In 22 years, is that right? So there you go. In 22 years, Hurricane Harvey has been one of the most largest and destructive storms ever faced. I was listening to a preacher during the week and he said this, Hurricane Harvey will not be remembered for uh, its destructive winds, but for its floods. And I mean, if you're able to see any pictures and uh, you know that uh, it showed you of a before and after shots of, if you know their road systems and how high they are and the level that the water got to and uh, the amount of people that had to be rescued. I mean, it was, uh, it was a devastating thing. Yeah. And now they've got another one. Irma's coming on through and then they've got fires everywhere and Kim Jong-un is letting off nuclear missiles and uh, uh, Australia's in a mess. The world is in a mess, isn't it? I mean, the world itself is going through a tumultuous storm. Uh, aren't you glad Jesus can speak to the storm? Amen. But Charles Lawson, the preacher that I was listening to, said, uh, as I said, Hurricane Harvey will not be remembered for its destructive winds, but for its damaging floods. And he also said this, he said, when the storm came along, they were tracking it, 
and it started out as a tropical low, and we're not immune to this here in Queensland, across the top end of Australia. We don't have the hurricanes, we have the cyclones, but it's, a, it's the same thing, that the tropical low comes in and they track it and, and they're watching for the conditions and, and uh, you know, then it builds and it builds and then it becomes a cyclone category one, two, three, four, five and so forth. And, and they were saying when they were tracking Harvey, started out as a, as a low, but then got into a category of a, of a hurricane, but then backed off again and went back into a tropical low, but then went into the Gulf of Mexico and it just with full force, just opened up, became, I think it was a category four, hit land, went on in land and, and just, just decimated, just decimated, just things were destroyed all over the place. And, uh, you know, sometimes storms are like that. And, and the disciples encountered this storm as well, where they were told to go to the other side and, and uh, they're out there and they're rowing and they're going to where Jesus said to go. And, and uh, this storm came up. And sometimes storms in life can come suddenly, can't they? Sometimes the storms in life that we face can be very unexpected. And uh, the fierceness of the storm... But you know, it was during the storm here that we see the Lord Jesus Christ performing perhaps one of his most miraculous miracles. He walked on the water. How many of us know of any people that have walked on water? Can you tell me, have you ever known anyone else besides Jesus and Peter to walk on water? I don't think there is. I don't think there ever will be. But, uh, you know, we see Jesus walking on water. Uh, but if that's not enough, as I said, we see Peter now stepping out of the boat and walking on the water. I mean, how miraculous is that? Yes, we could say Jesus is walking on the water. And notice he's walking on the water during the midst of the storm. So he's, he's doing a miraculous thing in the midst of the storm here. Peter gets out of the boat while the wind is contrary. The, the, ra- the waves are crashing. He steps down out of the boat and he walks on the water to go to Jesus as well. Now, someone once said this, a preacher once said this, wait until you have walked as many steps on the water as Peter walked before you criticise him for sinking. I like that. Because more often than not, when we read passages like this, we remember the Lord Jesus and what he did, and that's true, we should. But then when we see one of the disciples doing something and they start out great and they end up in a big mess, we often remember them for their wrongdoing or for their messing up than what we did for what they did right. What's the most famous thing that David is known for? Killing Goliath. Adultery. Yeah, a lot of people say, oh, he sinned with Bathsheba. What about Peter? When we think about Peter, we think about him denying Christ and cursing and doing all this sort of thing. But we forget everything else that he did. So before we criticise him for sinking, let's walk on the water as long as what he did before we can do that. Amen. So the message tonight is, uh, this morning is not going to focus on the fact that he sank. And we know that he sank. We know that was a part of it. We know that he took his eyes off the Lord. We might mention a little bit about it, but that's not the, that's not the thrust behind the message this morning. If we're not careful, we see the miraculous and we do forget the message. The message in this is that Peter didn't step out of the boat to become a somebody. He didn't step out of the boat just to say, hey, I walked on water to go to Jesus. And I actually believe that he walked on the water with Jesus to go back to the boat. I don't think Jesus lifted him up and picked him up and carried him like a baby and said, hey, let's go on back to the boat. I think that Jesus and Peter together walked on the water to go back to the boat. But the walking on the water is not what, uh, w- what we want to think about today. The message in this miracle is found, if you look at verse number 29 again, it says this, and he said, come. And when Peter was come down out of the ship, he walked on the water. Now, what's the next phrase? To go to Jesus. To go to Jesus. To go to Jesus. The thrust behind Peter stepping out of the boat was not to become a somebody, but his thrust was that he wanted to go to Jesus. And if we're not careful, we forget about that. We, we like to magnify the miraculous. And I don't think there's really a problem with that. We serve a miracle working God. I, I still believe that God is the God of miracles even today. I don't think miracles have ceased. I believe in a God who does that. I believe in a, in a God who still can heal the sick. I still believe he can do an amazing thing. But if we're not careful, we look at the miracle, but we forget the message. 
The message behind the miracle here is that Peter wanted to go to Jesus. Now, in our journey that we call life, we're making our way to Jesus too, aren't we? You say, oh, hang on a second, Pastor, Jesus lives in me. Yes, I know. As a matter of fact, Colossians says that, that the Godhead was complete in Christ uh, and then we are complete in Him. So I understand that not only do I have Jesus, I have the, I have the Godhead living inside of me. Isn't that an amazing thought? Because I'm complete in Christ. And if in Christ, the, the Godhead was, was complete in Christ, in His body, we see the Godhead in action and I receive Christ, I've got the Father, Son and Holy Spirit living in me. I've got God in me. Amen? Amen. But how many understand that according to John chapter 14 and, and uh, verse number 3 and 4, that uh, Jesus said this, He says, I go to prepare a place for you that where I am, there ye may be also. So in this journey that we call life, when we got saved, or even when we were born physically, when we were born physically, the foreknowledge of God, the foreknowledge of God, God knew who was going to get saved. God knows who's going to get saved and who's not. God knew that when I was born on the, on the, on the uh, 27th of August, 1969, that's going back a fair way now, I'm 48 this year, but hey, you know, that's why. But he knew that when I was born, he knew he had foreknowledge. I don't have foreknowledge, so I have to witness to people. But he knew that when I was born, that I was going to get saved. So my life, my life, and we say Christian life, it's life. If you're a Christian, you're a Christian in this life. And it's not life that we live. Isn't it, isn't it dotted here and there with Hurricane Harvey's everywhere? Isn't it dotted in life through different tropical cyclones that hit us, those storms that just seem to come out of nowhere? And perhaps we are keeping an eye on things and we're tracking certain things in our life and then the storm builds up and then it dies off again and we think, phew, oh wow, I didn't have to face that one. And then all of a sudden out of nowhere the storm rises up and it, and it hits us for six. So in this journey that we call life, Jesus saved us. He's gone home to prepare a place for us that where he is, we're going to be there with him. So we are making our way through this life to go to Jesus. Now I'm glad, side note, I'm glad that when Jesus said go to the other side, when Jesus said go and do something, it's going to happen regardless. But the humanity that we see in the disciples here when the storm came up, now understand this, notice that during the storm they didn't perceive who Jesus was. We have to be very careful about that, that we don't get our eyes off of Christ like Peter did. We understand that. We don't get our eyes off of Christ, but we, we keep our eyes on the Lord so we can perceive the Lord. We know who the Lord is during the storm. We need to know the God of the storm. Yes. Hebrews chapter 12. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. You know, we do begin to sink, and let's get it out of the way so we can move on. We begin to sink the moment we take our eyes off of Christ. The moment we take our eyes off the Lord Jesus Christ and we get our eyes on the storm or we get our eyes on the situation, we get our eyes on the problems, the moment we take our eyes off of Jesus and put it somewhere else, we begin to sink. But how many are glad that immediately when you cry out, Jesus stretched forth his hand and raised us? I'm glad about that. So we want to move that. We get that out the way. Yes, Peter sank. And we sink. I've sank a few times. I mean, I've gone down like a box of rocks at times. Got my eyes off the Lord. Thought things were going. Got my eyes off the Lord. Began to sink. And the moment I cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately he stretches forth his hand and raises me up. I'm glad about that. You should be glad about that too. So just like the disciples, we too face storms that may come upon us suddenly, unexpectedly. Remember last week we looked at the unexpected? You know, sometimes it's just a phone call. Sometimes it's a doctor's visit. Sometimes it could be a text message, an email. But sometimes something suddenly comes up in our life and then all of a sudden... Everything turns tumultuous. The winds become contrary. The winds are boisterous. The waves are raging. 
And notice that when there is a storm, it's not quiet either. The noise is going on and we are surrounded by swirling things. Things are going on. Our mindsets are being pulled in different directions. Our life is being pulled in different directions. And if we're not careful, we get caught up in the storm instead of keeping our eyes on Jesus Christ as we go through the storm. Now, some Christians will stay in the safety and the confines of the boat while they're going through the storm. And that's good. We know we have an anchor. We sang that song. We have an anchor. Jesus Christ is our anchor and and He keeps us safe and He keeps us secure. And when the storms of life are raging, we ought to stay in the boat. Do you remember what the Apostle Paul said in Acts chapter 27 when he was going to Rome? And and by the way, that's another thing too. I've got another message. Remember last week I get all these thoughts. You know when when Jesus said you're going to Rome, nothing was going to stop Paul from getting to Rome, even a ship. But do you remember what the Apostle Paul said when he was on the boat? He said, and everyone's chucking everything out. They were going to ditch out and get out. He says, no, no, no. If you you abandon the ship, you're going to be killed. Stay in the boat. So there are times where we stay in the safety and the confines and the comfort of the boat. That could be be your home. That could be uh, the house of God. Whatever it is. Jesus is there. We're in the safety and confines. That is great. That's fantastic. But do you know that there's always going to be some that are going to go to another level and step outside the boat to walk on water, so to speak, to go to Jesus? It's like another level of faith. What I admire greatly about Peter, lots of things I admire about Peter, probably because we can all identify them because we all put our feet in our mouth, don't we? It's like Peter just says some stuff at times. But I like Peter because of his boldness, because of his brashness. It's like, man, I'm I'm just going to step out here and I'm going to walk on water. I'm not going to go to Jesus. And it was like Peter went another level of faith. We can stay in the boat. And I don't think Jesus would be upset. But do you know what? You know what we need today in, in this day that we face with all these storms that are going? We need some Christians that are happy and willing to step out of the safety and the confines and the comfort of the boat and start walking on some water to go to Jesus. We need some Christians that will just have some boldness and some faith and say, you know what, Lord, uh, you know, I might sink, but hey, I want to attempt something great for God in my life. I don't want to die and go and be with Jesus, never having tried to accomplish anything great for Jesus Christ. What a sad existence that would be. Glad I'm saved, but just to be saved and, and, and know that I'm saved and I'm on my way to heaven, but just sit there and do nothing. I, I, I can't fathom that. It is a, it's, a, it's, a, it's an amazing thing to stand up here and, and preach and teach in front of people. And if you're not used to it, it's, it's like, you know, it's a scary thing. It's a scary thing for someone to get up without any music and just sing a cappella in front of people just to, to sing unto the Lord and be a blessing. And it was a great song. I enjoyed listening to the song. The song ministered to my spirit. But it's like stepping out of the comfort of the pew. <laughs> it's stepping out of the comfort and the confines of where you're seated and get seated, seated, whatever, and stand in front of people and do something for Jesus Christ. <laughs> now, with that thought in mind, I just want to give you really four thoughts about Peter stepping out of the boat. The first one is this we will be challenged during challenging times. I like the fact that Peter was challenged to step out of the boat during a very challenging period in his life. And you might think, why is that? One reason I think that is, is that while we're going through challenging times, more often than not, we are in tune with the Lord. I mean, it's the difficulties, it's the storms that we face that bring us closer to God, or that it should, amen? 
We're, we're, we're going through something, it's difficulty there, and, and we're praying and we're reading, and, and, and there's the struggle, you know what I mean, of concentrating on the Word of God and praying, and the storm comes, and you, you're reminded of that, but you want to bring yourself back here, and, and you're trying to walk with the Lord during a, during a stormy time in life, but it's during that challenging period in your life that God may challenge you to step out of your boat. He said, Come, what an invitation! I'm wondering this morning how many people in this small congregation has God challenged since this church has started or even in your entire Christian life? How many times has God challenged you in your life to step out of that boat during some very difficult times and say, trust me, walk on the water, keep your eyes on me, I want to use you, I want to do this, have your faith in me. How many people are here this morning where God has challenged them to do something great for him but have stayed in the confines and the comfort of their boat? I'll be honest with you, I don't like boats. I, 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 would never, I would never be upset if you never invited me out on your boat to go out to Darwin Banks. I'm just putting that out there. Honestly, I would never be upset. If you invite me out there, I'll say, I'm sorry, I'm busy. Mate, you, I mean, I've, I've been out on a boat, and you talk about going out there. There's nothing around there, is there? It's like you're out in the middle of nowhere. You've got no land. You've got no points of, of direction, you've got your compass and everything, and I don't want to be out there if a storm raises up, because I don't want to practice literally walking on water. <laughs> I will sink. <coughs> but when we think about it metaphorically, when we're going through tough times in life, it is during those difficult, challenging periods in our life where Jesus challenges us to do something for him. Not to make the individual look great, but to make Christ look great. That's what it's all about. If you want to step out of your boat to do something great for Christ, because you want to be a somebody, forget it. Forget it. You don't have to do that. When you want to make God look great, you know what he does? He will promote you. He will lift you up. That's what he does. Let me, let me give you this challenge. When you are facing your problems, and Brother Chris mentioned problems this morning, when you are facing your problems in life, I want to challenge you to find the promises that speak to your problems. How many of you believe in the promises of God? All right. How many promises are you claiming right now for something in your life? How many promises do you actually know? I want to challenge you not just to meditate and memorize Psalm 138, though I walk in the midst of trouble. We could say Peter's walking in the midst of trouble right here. How good is this fixing in with Sunday nights on revival? But Peter stepped out of the boat and he's walking in the midst of trouble. Come on, the winds are there, the waves are there. It's contrary, it's ugly, it's horrible. But he's walking in the midst of trouble. He's going to Jesus and though he's walking in the midst of trouble, the Bible says that we will be revived. But how many promises do you know? How many promises are you claiming? You don't need to have 500 promises just to speak to one problem. You only need one. One. I'm struggling with, with, with paying my bills or whatever it is. My God will supply my every need. Luke 6.38, give and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, shall be in your bosom. Let me tell you why sometimes we don't use promises like that. Because of the word of faith movement that have, that have plagiarised and butchered so many of those promises to make it something that it was never designed to be. And what we do is we are afraid to claim those promises because such and such says, well, if you claim that, you can be in the prosperity gospel. And we don't claim those promises yet. They're there for us to claim. Lord, you said if I give, you will give it back to me, a good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over shall men give into your bosom. For with the same measure that you meet, it shall be given to you again. So how many promises do you know? What a challenge. When you face your problem, to find the promises of God that speak to your problem. Let me say this, though. Let me just say this, though. Have a look at, uh, look at verse uh, number uh, 29 again. 
Verse number 29, 28 and 29. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it be thou, bid me come unto thee on the water. And he said, come. Before you step out of your boat, hear me now. Before you step out and you want to do something great, make sure you get confirmation that it's Christ calling you. Did you hear me? Don't step out of your boat to walk on the water if it's not confirmed that Christ is calling you to do that. Foolish. How many people do we know, Brother Chris, that perhaps stepped out of their boat, they wanted to start a church, they wanted to do this, they wanted to go on missions and all this sort of stuff, but God never called them. They perhaps got caught up in the emotion of a, of a missions conference or the emotion of a Bible conference or, 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 or uh, I, I saw a flag and, and, and that flag spoke to me about going to such and such a country. And I'm not saying that God couldn't use the flag, but you better make sure that it's Christ calling you and getting confirmation that he's calling you before you step out and do something. Second thought. What was unstable was made stable by the word. We looked at this or mentioned this last week about the instability, the fluidity that that, that word is used in society today, about gender fluidity. And when I think of fluid, I think of water. When I think of water, I think of something that's unstable. Would you agree with me that when Peter stepped out of the boat, when he's going to walk on water, do you think water is a very stable thing to walk on? But what made the unstable stable was the word. He, I like one preacher said this. He didn't step out to walk on the water. He stepped out to walk on the word. So it's the word of God that gives you stability when you're in a very unstable time in life. I think we better be men and women of the book. Amen. We ought to not just pick it up on a Sunday or listen to the preacher preaching it out of a Sunday. I encourage you every day of the week, pick up your Bible and read your Bible. Put it in your cassette, cassette tape, man. That's <laughs> Put it in your DVD player in your car. Where did that come from? Cassette tape. It's like, my goodness. You know what it is, the Toyota. That Toyota uses cassettes. Can you believe that still uses cassettes? Put a, put a CD in, in your CD player and listen to uh, Alexander Scorby eloquently read the Bible. And I was saying to the, the guys the other day, they, they've got Alexander Scorby going everywhere. Someone once said, if they get to heaven and God doesn't sound like Alexander Scorby, they're going to be very upset. <laughs> <laughs> but we've got to get the word. We've got, to, we've got to meditate on the word. We've got to meditate on his precept. We've got to ring it all out. Though I walk in the midst of trouble, though I walk in the... Thou, God, you will revive me. Listen, meditate on that. Ring every little bit out of that. Get that juicy machine going and dwell. And allow the word of God to become a part of you. And when you're going through your storms in life, you step out on the word, not out on the water. Listen to this verse in Isaiah 33, verse number 6. And wisdom and knowledge shall be the stability of thy times. Wisdom and knowledge shall be the stability of thy times. We all agree, not to, not to labour the point, we all agree that we are in very unstable times in Australia. This world is a very unstable place. Jesus is coming back. Hallelujah, he's coming back soon. But there is instability. And do you know what's going to help us as Christians during an unstable time, it's right here. It's wisdom and knowledge. Where does that come from? Oh, it comes from God. Yes, right here. Right there. Wisdom and knowledge. God wants to give us wisdom and knowledge in these unstable times. So when Peter stepped out of the boat, he stepped out onto something that was unstable but was made stable because of what Christ said. In other passages, we see Jesus. There was another time they're going through. Jesus is asleep in the boat. Man, he's up the front there. He's asleep. He's not worried about anything. The disciples, oh, Lord, save us, help us. We're going to die. We would be like that. Come on, wouldn't we? Let's not crucify them. I mean, we would, we would be in the boat. Man, if I went out with John and it started taking in water, I'd be like... I wouldn't be like, hey, bro, there's some water coming in the boat. Man, I would be like, ah, let's get out of here. There's water coming in the boat. Where's the life jacket? Put that flare up. Get the, get the, say, what is it, lifeguard? No, what is it? The, those guys that come out and rescue people, the, come on, help. It's Coast Guard. Get the Coast Guard out there quick. We're taking it. What, man? I wouldn't be calm. Turn on the bills, 
<laughs> Is it working? <laughs> How Mary Baller back to it? No. <laughs> Hebrews 4.12 says that the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. Quick, it's alive. It's alive. It's powerful. It speaks to every situation that you're going through. It's a discerner of the thoughts and intents. Now get this, the thoughts and intents of the heart. It even affects the physical body. Did you know that? Did you know that? Have a look at it. Hold your place there. Have a look at Hebrews chapter 4 for a minute. You're looking at me like, are you sure about that? Go to Hebrews chapter 4. I'm there, so let me read it. Hebrews 4.12. For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder. Now look at this. Of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow. That's the body right there. And is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Do you know that the word of God affects every part of man? I want you to go to Proverbs. Go to Proverbs with me, please. Proverbs chapter 4. I want to show you this. I remember reading a testimony of a guy many, many years ago that just took the Bible at face value. That's a novelty, isn't it? Let's just take the Bible at face value. Let's just believe what the Bible says, amen? Yes. I mean, let's not just cut it up and, oh, well, you know, blah, 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 blah. Let's just take it for what it says. Look at uh, Proverbs chapter 4. Remember, the, the word of God affects every area of life. It affects your spirit, it affects your soul, and it affects your body. Look at Proverbs 4. Look at verse number 20. My son, attend to my words, incline thine ears unto my sayings. Let them not depart from thine eyes, but keep them in the, in the midst of thine heart. How do you do that? You meditate on the word. For they, what is they? His words are life. Unto those that find them and health to all their flesh. The Hebrew for health there is medicine. Medicine. Do you know that God's word is good medicine for you? Not just for your spirit, not just for your soul, but also for your physical body. Now think about that. When you attend to the word of God, when you have it before you, when you meditate on it, the word of God becomes life to those of you who find the word and it becomes health to all your flesh. There is something about the quickening power of the word of God. How many times have you come to church and you've not been well, but you've left well? Anybody been like that? You've gone to jail. Yeah, I've, been, I've been to church, man. Uh, you know, this morning, I didn't even know I was going to be able to preach this morning. But there's something about the Word of God. You come to church and though you feel drowsy and though you feel this and though you feel that, and it's like, oh, I really don't feel like it. You know, the devil works the hardest on people when it comes Sunday. Have you ever noticed that? It's like Sunday comes around and Saturday night you have a rubbish night's sleep and you've got to get up early and this is going on and I just don't feel 100%. But when you go to church and you listen to the singing and you worship God and, and, you, and you have the preaching of the Word of God, there have been times where I've come sick and I've gone perfectly home well. The word of God is quick and powerful. What was unstable was made stable by the word. Thirdly, let's go back to Matthew 14. Thirdly, Peter was willing to face anything to go to Jesus. Peter was willing to face anything to go to Jesus. The wind was boisterous. The wind was contrary. And you know what? When you think about that, isn't it amazing that when you want to step out and do something great for God, there's always something that's contrary. And let me just say this. It's one thing, it's one thing for the devil to be contrary to us and when we want to step out and do something great for God. But how many of us know, unfortunately, that there's some brethren out there that just seem contrary when we want to step out and do something great for God? You know... As, as we grow, and as, and as our kids, and, and you know, we get more families and more kids, and our kids grow up, and, 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 and one of the kids, maybe he's a teenager, or he's a young adult, maybe like Robert or whatever, says, you know what, 
I really believe that God is calling me to do this and do that. You know what? Let's not get the wet blanket. Let's not get the bucket of water and pour it out and say, well, brother, just calm down for a little bit. You'll get over it. Have a little lie down. No, you know what we ought to do? If, if, a, if, a, if one of our kids, a teenager or a young adult, believes that God is calling them to do something great for him, we ought to be encouraging that instead of dousing it out with water. So it's one thing for Satan to be contrary, and he is. Anytime we want to do something for God, anytime we want to step out by faith, he's always there. The spirit and the flesh, the one is contrary to the one to the other, so that you cannot do the things that you would. It's there. We don't recognize it at times, though. And we are stopped by the slightest things. In Acts chapter 20 and verse number 24, Paul the Apostle was told that he was going to face some really difficult things as he was going to Rome. Remember he had the shipwreck? Listen to what he says. But none of these things move me. Neither count I my life dear unto myself. None of these things move me. Paul, you're going to go to Rome. This is what, and, and Agabus, the prophets were there. Now they were saying, you're going to face this and you're going to have this and you're going to have difficulty and you're going to be bound and all this sort of stuff. He said, none of these things move me. I'm going to go. The Lord said go, so I'm going. And you know what? He got there. But what does it take to move you? What does it take to move me? Paul, I've called you to go and do this. Okay. And you know what? It starts out really good. The weather's fine. Sun's shining. Oh, it's a beautiful day, isn't it? That's amazing. Wonderful. But we are in danger of becoming fair weather Christians. What, what would it be like if it turned black and nasty? Thunder and lightning and heavy rain and stuff blowing around everywhere. And <clears throat> would that move you away from doing what God's called you? Proverbs, oh sorry, Psalm 46 verse 1 says this, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Didn't want to mention it again, but how, how, how present was Jesus when Peter began to sink? How present was he? Acts 15, verse number 26. You remember when uh, uh, Paul and Barnabas were going back to Antioch? They took Judas and Silas. Not Judas Iscariot, he was already dead. Judas and Silas. Do you know what testimony Judas and Silas had? Let me read it to you. They were men that have hazarded their lives for our Lord Jesus Christ. They went with Paul and Barnabas. They went to the work. Is it any wonder that God separated Silas to work with Paul after Barnabas took John Mark? Silas was a man that had already proved himself, hazarded his life for Jesus Christ. I would say Silas stepped out of his boat a few times. Let me give you the last thought, and it's this. Ready, Megan? <laughs> She was looking at my notes. My kids do that. She came with me in the car this morning and she said, oh, what are you preaching on? Grab my Bible. Have a, they have a look. Robert, Robert discerns how long the message is going to be by how many notes I've got. <laughs> and Megan's just like, oh, okay. And then she laughs at this, this point here. Number four, the fierce storm was eclipsed by a strong faith. The fierce storm was eclipsed by a strong faith. When Jesus walked on the water, he was walking and the storm was already there. When Peter said, Lord, if it be thou, bid me come, the storm was there and Jesus invited him to come out on the storm. But you know what? Peter's faith eclipsed the storm while he focused on Jesus. It was only, as I said, when he took his eyes off and was distracted. Distracted. Remember that. Distracted. Distractions. Satan is a master at distractions. Master at it. And if we're not careful, we could be distracted. Now, I know that there's stuff going on with votes and so on and so forth and all that sort of stuff. If we're not careful, we could get distracted by that and not remain focused on what we're here to do. What is that? To be a witness for Jesus Christ. The fierce storm was eclipsed by a strong faith. 
Let me say this. Don't criticise a Christian who steps out of the boat to attempt something great and begins to sink. At least they attempted something. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Remember, we go back to the point where be, be a man and woman of the word. Get in the Bible. Get in the book. Someone had once said this. He said this. It's the I can. It's the I can that makes a great man. And the verse that this preacher was using was Philippians 4.3. I can do all things through Christ. I can. I, can do, I can't do it on my own. I do it all through Jesus Christ. While some will remain within the confines of their comforts, others will be challenged to step out and to go to Jesus. I want to encourage you that though the storm rages, keep your eyes on the Lord. If Jesus says come and wants you to step out, and I don't know what it is, I really don't, whatever he talks to you about, I want you to sing a song. I want you to teach Sunday school one time. I want you to do this. Whatever it is, if it's to step out of the boat to go to Jesus, then go. But that's the message. That in this life that we are in, we are going to go to Jesus. And storms are going to come and storms are going to go. But you know what? Jesus has told us that we're already going to get to heaven. He's already told us I hate using this term. We're going to the other side. Just that one day, whether he comes back in the moment of twinkling of an eye, or whether we go through, whether we go through death or whatever it is, one minute we're here, next minute we're with him. But we're going to face those storms. So remain strong in the storm. Amen. Amen. Father, we love you. We thank you for the word of God. We ask, Lord, that you would encourage us and challenge us and help us, Lord, in these times. I don't know what it is, Lord, that people are facing and the struggles and the difficulties that they have, you know what they are. You know what they are. And I pray, Father, for the brother or the sister in Christ that's here that perhaps is going through, they're in the midst of a storm, they're at the beginning of a storm, or perhaps they're coming to the end of something. I pray that they would keep their focus, that they would keep their eyes on you, and that they would grow in their faith, and that their faith would eclipse the storm. God, I pray that you would help each and every one of us. Bless us, we pray in Jesus' name. And all God's people say, Amen. Amen. All right, let's sing a song, shall we, before we part. What was that first one we had? Let's do 379 again. 379. Sang it so well. We have an anchor, Amen. sing the first and the last of this one just the first and the last first one will your anchor hold in the storms of life when the clouds unfold their winds of strife when the strong tides lift and the cables strain will your anchor Drift or firm remain. We have an anchor that keeps us soul steadfast and sure while the billows roll. Fastened to the rock which cannot move, grounded firm and deep in the sea. Verse 3 When our eyes behold through the gathering night the city of gold, our harbor. We shall anchor fast by the heavenly shore With the storms all past forevermore We have an anchor that keeps us all Steadfast